I want to talk about uh, where we are and the possibility of taking refuge in the good that does endure, no matter what ups and downs might be happening. And I want to explore with you, increasingly experientially, how to take refuge in the good that lasts. So first of all, uh, first of all there are what the Buddha called the first darts of life, unavoidable, inescapable, physical, and emotional discomfort from subtle to overwhelming. And um, if you are among those people that are finding the current uh, election process or the state of the world to be a first dart for you, that's really understandable. And the, the Buddha taught with regard to first darts that first and foremost, we need to be able to be with them. Understandably, to feel the concern or perhaps a sense of being punched in the stomach, or maybe depending on your own view of things, you know, happiness about some of the outcomes, whatever they are. With regard to first starts, the fundamental practice is to feel it, to let it flow, to let it open your heart as it flows on through. And try not to add any second darts. These are the reactions that we throw ourselves in which we follow or feed our various preoccupations. We get caught up in ruminating. You know, we check our phone or TV news just, you know, again and again and again. We find ourselves starting to talk back to the TV screen, speaking personally here. Those are second darts. Those are second darts. Uh, and it's really important to disengage from ill will. It doesn't mean we agree with people or approve of them. Anger may arise. Anger is a first start experience. It may be a natural reaction, much as there's a natural pain in the foot if a brick falls on it. Maybe anger, moral outrage, sense of injustice arises. These are normal experiences. We can be with them as, as it were, first starts in life, without getting caught up in ill will and fantasies of vengeance and dehumanizing others and working ourselves up into a frenzy. All that poisons and corrodes the heart. So not adding second darts, including primarily by not getting invested in them and you know preoccupied with them and identified with them, and also primarily turning to what is genuinely good, kind of using it, what is genuinely good, as flowers, in effect, to crowd out the weeds of our negative second art reactions to things. So I want to focus here on the feeling, not just the idea, that's easy, the feeling of the good that endures, in which you can rest and take refuge and find your true home. I'm going to approach this initially following the Buddha's description of people like us who are dedicated in practice in one way or another, uh, have a kind of a sincerity about, our, about them. And he described people in this way. He said one is sincere in practice, who is ardent, resolute, diligent, and mindful. Ardent means heartfelt, enthusiastic, courageous, or to, to bring a whole heart to something. It might seem like a fancy word, uh, but that's what it really boils down to. So I'd like to explore uh, the good that we can find within ourselves in terms of this kind of structure of being ardent, resolute, diligent, and mindful. A good that endures inside ourselves, no matter what's happening around us. So I'd like to do this as kind of a meditation, as an experiential exploration of these things. I'll offer a few questions. I'll pause a little bit. 
I'll keep on going. If you're um, engaging this in the recording later on, because we post the recording of these always within a few days, uh, feel free to pause the recording. And uh, you might want to come back to this yourself later, uh, even after going through it directly tonight. Okay, so ardent. One aspect of being ardent, which is a good inside us, is caring for others. So bring to mind someone that you care for. You have friendliness toward, you appreciate, you maybe love. And take a moment, really, to register that this is how you feel. It's true. Bring to mind other beings you care for, perhaps including pets. And know that your caring is real. You might softly say to yourself things like, I do care. I do appreciate so-and-so. I do love. Be aware of the good that is in your caring. And know that this is stably true of you. You are a caring person. You don't have to be perfect about it. You are a loving person. And you can take refuge in this lovingness that endures. A second aspect of being ardent is to bring to mind something that you care about. In other words, a key value for you. Perhaps you care about telling the truth, or you care about children, or nature, or simply treating others with decency and respect. So be aware of a genuine value you hold, something you do care about. And know that you truly feel this way. Your values are your values, independent of what happens outside you. Know that you truly feel this way. Bring to mind other things you care about, other values, other purposes. And as you do this, know that this is really how you feel. You can count on caring about these things. Get a sense of the good in this valuing, even passionate, even fiery valuing. Get a sense of the good in it.
and know that this is stably true about you. No one can stop you from caring about what you care about. Know that whatever happens around you, what other, whatever other people say or do, your own love, your own valuing is independent of all that. It remains. It is solid. It endures no matter what happens outside you. You can find refuge in this. Resting in, standing in your values and what you love. The whole world can swirl around you while you stand in your values and what you love. Letting the sense of this sink in. Now let's explore some of the good that endures within you in terms of being resolute, kind of a fancy word for being determined or committed. So find a sense of commitment or determination to those you care for. You're loyal to them. You intend to be helpful. Also, find a sense of determination toward things you care about, your values, the causes that are important to you. Know what determination feels like as a quality inside you. You may be knocked down. You may be slowed down. You may need to take some breaks for a while. But deep down inside, you can acknowledge the resolve that exists within you. You can form resolve in various ways. And you can know that this good in you endures. You don't just care about things. You actually want to move in that direction with determination and commitment. Appreciate that your resolve, your determination is real, even if you don't adhere to it perfectly. Get a sense that your determination is a good thing. In the ways that you are determined, know that you're determined.
You can count on it. Focus on how you are determined. No matter what is swirling around you, you can keep trying. See if you can get a sense of giving over to your resolve, giving over to your commitments, the commitments of your heart, so they move through you and carry you along. They move you through life. You can trust in what you are truly committed to. Whatever happens outside you, you can rest in your own determination. Simple determination to do what you can. And then third, diligent. Keeping it simple, pick something that you handle diligently, conscientiously, even if not perfect, even if not perfectly. Uh, are you consistent about closing the refrigerator door after, you, after you're done with the refrigerator? Uh, do you diligently stop at red lights? In other words, just get a sense of the ways in which you really do make efforts. You can trust in this. You don't have to be perfect. Uh, it's okay. We always have room for improvement. But be aware of ways in which you really are diligent, steadfast. You keep trying. Know that it's real. Be aware of ways you make efforts, maybe with other people, or one person in particular, perhaps ways you make efforts at work. And know this about you. You're someone who, in your way, keeps trying. You might say to yourself, I do keep trying. <laughs> I do keep going. Yeah, I slack off sometimes, but then, you know, I keep plugging away after a while. Honor this about yourself. Know it about yourself. Know that uh, you can take refuge in the fact that you will make efforts. You don't have to be perfect. Try not to get distracted by self-doubt or self-criticism. Get a feeling for the fact that you do keep trying. You keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep breathing. You keep going. This is in you. These qualities are in you. This is about you, no matter what is happening elsewhere. It's so simple, it's deceptively simple, but we can take refuge in the fact of being someone who does make efforts, who does try, even if imperfectly. 
you can feel the diligence in yourself and appreciate it and rely on it and kind of let it carry you along. Just keep stepping. Keep trying. This is your diligence. It's a quality in you. And all those other people, oof, they will just do whatever they do. And meanwhile, you can take refuge in your own sincere efforts. And then mindful. Let's slow down and simply be present. Mindfully aware of what is going on around you and inside you. Know what it is like to be mindful. Your mindfulness is real. It is good. can always return to it. You can always be mindful, whether things are at their best or their worst. Recognize some of what is good in mindfulness. Know that you can be mindful whenever you want, and you can find the goodness in mindfulness whenever you want. And as you become increasingly mindful as a trait, the good of mindfulness becomes increasingly stable in you. Independent of whatever is happening in the world. Looking more deeply into mindfulness, recognize the simple fact of awareness. Awareness as a field through which experiences flow. Awareness itself is stable as impermanent experiences occur. You can always count on awareness, never damaged or stained by what arises and passes away within it.
awareness endures. You can always abide as awareness. Taking refuge in awareness, feeling its goodness. So as we finish this experiential reflection, and in a moment I'll respond to questions or comments that have come in in the chat sidebar, Um, I want to point out, of course, that we can also be aware of other good things that endure. I deliberately focused on uh, this teaching from the Buddha and good within us of different kinds. And there are obviously other kinds of good that endure Uh, as well, Um, such as the ways that this breath is good, this simple breath. This is a good breath. (laughs) You might even say it to yourself. Yes, a good breath. Yes, a good sip of water. Yes, a good sound, a good sight. Yes. How about Also, we can appreciate the ways in which the bonds of friendship and love are good. Connections with others. Uh, Even if our personalities sometimes rub against each other, uh, fundamentally, good relationships, good connections tend to endure. Um, Your contributions, your service to others, that's good too. You can take refuge in that. The taste of a peach, the sound of a bird, the sight of the moon, all of it's good. Yes, it endures. Our friends smile. The wisdom of the ages that we have completely historically unprecedented access to in our modern times. Um, All of that's good. Learning is good. Growing is good. Awakening is really good. And of course, practice. Knowing that you are someone who does practice. For me, one of my primary refuges is practice. Uh, I'm kind of a plugger, and I just know that I might be thoroughly rattled for a moment or two or just kind of shocked, but then fairly quickly, there's a, a movement into practicing with whatever is appearing. And that's something you can count on in yourself, too. It's a very good thing, knowing that you're somebody who does reflect on your experience and does try to learn from it, no matter how the world twists and turns. Your practice endures, and you can take refuge in it, always. So to finish, um, I was moved to write a little comment to a feisty friend of mine today. I hope it's appropriate here. I wrote my friend, fear not the orcs and trolls and shadows. Lots of things have been messed up, are messed up, and will be messed up. Meanwhile, enjoy the good that is real. And to quote that great teacher, Neil Young, keep on rocking in the free world. And to quote another great teacher, Leonard Cohen, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The world has always been cracked. The world is cracked. It will be cracked. That doesn't mean we should give up about it. It just means that it's part of the truth. And if we think that um, 
the world is uncrackable. <laughs> that is a prescription for suffering. As the Zen saying puts it, no mud, no lotus. We can grow certainly from simple, beautiful, peaceful, enjoyable experiences. We can also grow from disappointment, from heartache, from moral outrage at the suffering of others. All of these can tenderize the heart. And I hope that in the days to come, no matter what currents swirl around us, that each of us can continue to find the good that endures. And I really thank you for this chance to talk about this with you. Okay, let the wild rumpus begin. Any questions, any comments, what I've said so far? Let's see what we have. Yes, lot, you can see what other people have brought up in the chat. And I wanna make a general comment. Uh, Central to Buddhism is, of course, this notion of the middle way, or I think of as combinations of things. And in this territory of finding the good that endures, obviously there are nuances here that we don't want to use that practice as a spiritual bypass that takes us away from the bad that endures <laughs> or the bad that we could do something about or um, to feel righteous that we're superior somehow because we take refuge in this kind of good stuff and those bad people, bleh, they don't. They're pitfalls. But very often when we kind of move through almost abstract considerations about this, so sort of doubts or what ifs or but bleh, and you really just get to the simplicity of how do you want to be about it, right? And again and again, I think we keep finding that there's a sweet spot. That's a combination. You know, for example, there's a combination of, of seeing uh, and, and being open to what's painful, what's difficult, what's unfair, while at the same time, as um, I believe Howard Thurman put it, we can look out upon the world with quiet eyes. Both can be true. We can have goodwill for others that we're flabbergasted by, <laughs> let's say, and both can be true. We can, at a minimum, not let hatred invade our heart while at the same time being kind of stunned sometimes at the choices other people make, at least in terms of our own value system. And both can be true. So now I'm going to speak to or respond to some specific um, questions or comments that have come in. And in particular, I really encourage you to keep focusing on this fundamental question of where are you standing? Where does your mind dwell? Or to put it a little differently, what dwells within you? What dwells in your heart? Where do you dwell? What dwells within you? It's very fundamental. And a lot of abstract, complicated um, <clears throat> considerations about things really whoosh, get clarified when you zero in on, huh, where's my mind been dwelling lately? And what's been dwelling in my heart lately? And after reflecting on that, often there's a, some simple practical wisdom about what would be beneficial to lean more in the direction of, you know, what, what are we leaning into to dwell in and what are we leaning into to draw into ourselves so that it increasingly dwells inside us? Refuge, finding refuge, um, on the basis of which then we can be much more effective in dealing with the world, including the sorrows and the challenges within it. All right, let's see if I could speak to a particular question that's coming coming in. I like Sharon Salzberg's que uh, quotation from Shiva. Having compassion does not mean that you don't fight. It means that you don't hate. I'm gonna remember that and quote Sharon again. Um, okay, so Jack uh, Zaphos, what if we become aware of our values and feel them deeply, yet there are persons in power that act counter to our deep values. 
That's a key question, and and for me, it's the both and, right? We um, do what we can about those persons in power. Based on our values, whatever our politics might be, we do what we can. While at the same time, I just think it's phenomenal to appreciate the fact that whatever their values are, <laughs> and however, in our view, messed up <laughs> their values are, their goals, their aims, their priorities, whatever, whatever, over here, I'm standing in the ways in which I wish others well. I want to grow. I want to learn. I want to treat people with fairness. I'm committed to the principles of telling the truth and playing fair. You know, these are my values, and I value my values independent of whatever they do. And I can take refuge in the knowing in and the standing in my own values. Really important. My values are not compromised uh, by um, failing to implement them politically or otherwise in the world. You know, there are a lot of times that happens where we're trying to help a good thing occur based on our values and our diligence and our resolve, and it just doesn't happen. We can't do it. The center doesn't hold. We're outnumbered. Um, the fix is in. Causes and conditions weren't auspicious, whatever. But it doesn't mean that our values are not our values and that we cannot take refuge in them. And in some ways, they can feel very deep. Take refuge in your fundamental natural goodness. You know, the underlying wakefulness and lovingness and good wishingness that's, in my view, within everyone, sometimes quite deep down in some people. But anyway, uh, very important. Okay, let's see. What about triggers? Ralph asks a very important question. Or RAF, RAF. What about triggers and lack of strength to hold on? Very important. Um, for me, uh, one thing that motivates refuge, and it's really interesting that the Buddha, who was very ad advantaged just in terms of his own natural abilities and endowment, and then he was privileged in the social structure of his time, and you know, and he was very self reliant. Obviously, he spent roughly, as best we know, seven years or so. Of practice, wandering in the in the woods, dangerous and all that. And still this really capable, talented, uh, determined, individual, self-willed kind of person emphasized refuge and the humility of refuge. We need refuges. We need places of sanctuary. We need pit stops. We need places that, that refuel us. And so as Raf points out, when we um, are feeling like we're running on empty or the challenges are overwhelming, it's especially important to be honest enough and humble enough to realize, whoa, I, I, need, I, need to re <laughs> I need to reconnect with a mothership. I, I need to get back to my roots. I need to keep it simple. I need to make my bed. I need to brush my teeth. I need to plant one thing in my garden. I need to get something, I need to make something good to eat and turn off the news, disengage from the calls. Whatever my refuge is, I need to read something that's important and inspiring. I need to go meditate for a minute or more, right? So it's very important. So when we do feel challenged, when we do have a sense of lack of strength or we're triggered, those are all um, lights flashing. Uh, out in the world and in the inner dashboard that are saying, come back to refuge. Refuel yourself. Slow down. Get through it. Heal yourself. Build yourself up. And then step out and in to whatever the challenges may be. Very, very important. Refuge is a profound practice. Um, you may want to deliberately say to yourself, perhaps before you get out of bed in the morning, what you take refuge in or you ab abide as, which is a way of relating to refuge as already present and you're already present in it. Um, either way you do it is the sense of uh, finding refuge in and name it to yourself and slow down to feel it. So you might, as I have, say, you know, I, I take refuge in practice, and um, just diligent effort. Maybe you take refuge in the Buddha 
as a teacher and as also the fundamental wakefulness uh, in all of us. What else do you take refuge in? Do you take refuge in just the feeling of being with your dog or your cat or what it was like to be with your grandmother when you were young? What do you take refuge in? Science. The ultimate fact that facts are facts. It is a fact that facts are facts, and we can take refuge in that fact. So, refuge, really important. Even taking it as a practice for a minute or two in the morning before you get out of bed, as I have uh, for many years. It's really good. Okay, see if there are a few more, maybe one more, and then we'll finish up. Ah, great questions. Um, yeah, so I'm going to respond here. Barbara Ashland, Oregon. Uh, how to not be caught in the divisive angst when greed and lies are dominant aspects? How to see others and know their wholeness when the divisive aspects are overwhelming and upsetting? Deep, deep, deep question. Obviously, I'm not sure I fully grasp it, but I'm going to try to. Um, the sense of angst and the divisiveness and the sense of being mistreated, all of that could well be an authentic first start experience for a person. It's there. And to try to paper it over and let's all be nice and false equivalents and both sides and all the rest of that, it can often just be a way to avoid the first arc. And that just makes things worse. So when we're aware of those things, divisiveness, angst, disappointment, whatever it might be, dismay about what the future can hold, we can relate to all of that as a first start without feeding it without fueling it, without identifying with it, without following it. Very, very important. And for me, um, there's this combination of just getting the reactions that arise in my mind or like how it feels after you're punched in the stomach. You're going to have a reaction after that. It's real. So these, these reactions arise. I'm personally very politically engaged at a very granular level and informed. And I have a fair amount of clarity about my own value structure. And so, you know, stuff comes up. All right. We can feel that. We can let it flow. We cannot follow it, though, first. Second, we can be really clear-eyed about the state of the world and the causes and conditions that make things what they are. We can be very clear-eyed about that and we cannot get sentimental about the forces that, uh, depending on your values, are arrayed against your values. And we can be very clear-eyed, actually, in understanding really at bottom, as best we can, why other people do what they do and why they choose what they choose. We can have a lot of clarity about that. Yeah, there's limits to what we can know, but we can have a pretty good sense, including, as I believe Maya Angelou put it, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. We, we can have all that be present in our mind alongside letting the first starts flow, alongside real clarity about our own principled action alongside a fundamental compassion and open-heartedness toward others for our own sake, if not for them as well, alongside dwelling in and encouraging the dwelling in us of the good that endures. All these things can be true. With that, how about we just sit for a minute? Let it all kind of sink in. Disengaging from the froth and the foam and coming home to, what, to whatever feels 
stable and good for you. This breath is good. It is good that you care about things. You are good. And we can take refuge in this. Thank you very much.